What is the Schomburg Center? To me, it is home. The place where we come to see who we really are, not just somebody else's reflection of who we are. The Schomburg Center is a place of culture, it's a place of history, it's a place of knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is a repository of all of the things that has documented our sense of worth as a people. For me, that means that it is a place of immense power. The Schomburg Center is a public research library and a cultural institution. For the study of the Pan-African world, it is perhaps the best in the world. My Schomburg Center is Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. Arturo Schomburg said, Black history and culture and intellect exists at a time when most people didn't believe that. He collected those evidences, and that became the beginning of the collection. And it has expanded and has grown to where it is now a world-class institution. It holds over 10 million items. There's no parallel anywhere that brings to light what we as people of color have done, what we continue to do. Black culture is all of culture. The universals that animate everyone's life happen here for all people. The Schomburg for me is one of the center pillars of Harlem. When I started the journey of finding out about Red Rooster and Harlem, the very first place I went to was the Schomburg. Researchers from around the world come and use what we have here. I could not have written just about any of the books that I've written without the Schomburg Center's archives, resources. The Schomburg Center is much more than a library. We encourage lifelong learning and exploration. The Junior Scholars Program is a Saturday program with students from fifth grade to senior year in high school to help them learn about black history and culture. Learning about my history is important because it teaches me who I am. The Schomburg Junior Scholars Program is going to do nothing but uplift them. So many talented and brilliant people have walked the corridors of this amazing institution over the years. From Octavia Butler to Toni Morrison and James Baldwin, Ella Fitzgerald, Alvin Ailey, and Harry Belafonte, who graced the stage in this room of the American Negro Theater. This place evokes great memories. It was a gift to us in our community to really try to find that space to reflect expressions of black experience. I just knew that the environment and what I saw these young African Americans doing was a place I needed to be. What is my Schomburg Center? I'm standing here at the Cosmogram, which underneath holds the ashes of the poet Langston Hughes. On the evening when this cosmogram was dedicated, people began to empty out of the auditorium. A jazz trio struck up, and to my amazement, Amira Baraka went over and asked Maya Angelou for a dance. And they started to dance on top of the cosmogram, on top of the ashes of Langston Hughes, and I felt what a fitting way to kiss the memory of Langston. The Schomburg Center is a research institute and a library, but it's so much more than that. There's something going on every day. So many amazing people come here to talk about their creative craft, to share what inspires them. The Schomburg Center's collections help to tell stories even beyond our walls. The Schomburg Center is here in this exhibition at MoMA, One Way Ticket, Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series. We depend on the resources of the Schomburg to enable us to tell this story. Thinking about the implications of the past on the present is absolutely crucial for understanding the next steps, understanding what we have to do to go forward. We today have the responsibility of making sure that new artists and activists, new scholars and poets know that this place continues to be a resource and a source of inspiration for the work that we must continue to do. The Schomburg Center is knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is education. The Schomburg Center is home. It is family. It is foundational. The Schomburg Center is inspiration. The Schomburg is with me in everything that I do. Community, inside and out. The Schomburg Center is us. The Schomburg Center is you. And we invite each and every one of you to find your Schomburg Center.
good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Welcome to the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, where we celebrate and commemorate global blackness every day. I'm Joy Bivens, and I have the great privilege of serving as director of this historic institution. I also have the pleasure this afternoon of greeting you and saying how pleased my colleagues and I are to welcome you to the Schomburg Mixtape, our annual open house. There are so many places you could be, and we all know that, and that you chose to spend time with us brings us great joy. So I generally like to keep my remarks brief, um, but I, I want you to bear with me this morning or this afternoon, because as I was walking here today, uh, there was a song that my home church sings regularly that just kept echoing in my ear. And the lyrics, um, I won't go into them in full, go a little bit like this. I'm glad to be in his service. I'm glad to be in his service. I'm glad to be in his service one more time. And per perhaps because so much despair is surrounding us right now, um, violence is everywhere, our people's histories are being threatened with erasure, and books, which are literally the containers of ideas and voices, are being banned, I suppose this song just took on a new meaning to me because of the, the whole notion of service. Because at the end of the day, we are here to be in service to you. This collection is here to be in service to you, to the questions you have right now, and for the curiosity of those yet to be born. That is our charge, and why we will continue to steward and to make accessible the riches of black history and culture. In a few moments, you will hear from the curators of many of our collecting divisions. They have mined their holdings to share their choices with you this, this afternoon. And in the order that they are going to come, I'm going to just uh, let you know a little bit about them. You will first hear from the curator of manuscripts, archives, and rare books, Barry Brown. If you have questions about the archive, really, like what does it mean to, for a thing to be an archive, and the importance of memory work, I encourage you to speak with Barry. She is so knowledgeable about this field and what it really means to steward and to protect our histories. Following Barry is Dr. Delila Scruggs, curator of photographs and prints. Delila is an exceptional art historian who has been able to bring our photographic collections to life in just the short time she has been here. If you are curious about the intersection of black life and early and contemporary photographic practices, she is your go-to. Shala Lynch will follow her. She is our curator of moving image and recorded sound. Shala brings tremendous passion to the stewardship of audio and moving images that capture our histories and cultures. She is an award-winning filmmaker and documentarian who holds deep knowledge about the history of black film and black filmmakers. In fact, in the bookstore, there is a book called Regenerations where you can find an essay by Shala on uh, filmmaker William Greaves. The final presentation you will see will be offered by Dr. Brent Edwards, who among many other distinguished titles, he has a lot of jobs, serves as the director of Schomburg's Scholar in Residence Program, the New York Public Library's first and longest running fellowship program. Dr. Edwards is a multidisciplinary scholar whose latest book, Easily Slip Into Another World, A Life in Music, penned with the jazz musician Henry Threadgill, is available today for purchase in our shop. So uh, that was a plug before you leave, make sure you visit the shop. If you are not a society, Schomburg Society member, make sure you uh, join us in supporting the Schomburg Society. So I'd like to say that you're in for a real treat this afternoon with not only this program, but the many other programs, presentations, and activations being offered today. We hope you'll stay a while and join us for the 4.30 screening of Beach Street it's gonna be fun, and the reception afterward. I'd like to thank you again for being here and express my deep gratitude to all of my colleagues, especially Novella Ford and Kalila Bates, who have made this program possible. 
Um, now would you join me in welcoming Barry Brown to the stage. I wanna thank you and welcome you again. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us here today at our open house. My name is Barry Brown, and I am the curator of the Manuscripts, Archives, and Rare Books Division here at the Schomburg Center. Um, as Joy mentioned, all of the curators have been invited here today to talk a bit about their divisions, and today I will give you a brief introduction to my division, provide you with some exciting updates on the work that we're doing currently, and um, I'll end by highlighting the Anthony Horden Papers, a collection within my division that I think serves as a great complement to the current exhibition on display here called Marking Time, a Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration. So the Manuscripts, Archives, and Rare Books Division collects, preserves, and makes accessible rare, unique, and primary source materials that document the history and culture of people of African descent globally. The division's holdings, which are almost now 1,000 collections that amount to over 7,000 linear feet, include the personal papers of luminaries such as James Baldwin, Malcolm X, Lorraine Hansberry, Maya Angelou, and of course our namesake, Arturo Alfonso Schomburg, among many others. Our division also preserves the records of organizations and institutions, literary and scholarly typescripts and play scripts, sheet music, broadsides, programs and playbills, ephemera, and rare books. Our holdings represent a wide range of foreign language material, though the bulk are in English, French, and Spanish. In addition, our division is also responsible for maintaining the institutional records of the Schomburg Center. Our rare book holdings date from the late 16th century through the 20th century, um, but the bulk of the titles are pre-1865 imprints. At this time, our division is by appointment only. Um, however, we are still providing a folder a month of free scans to researchers through our electronic document delivery service. So for more information about visiting the division, please feel free to talk to me throughout the day at our open house. So as for updates, um, I'm very excited to share with you some updates related to grants that we have recently received that will help amplify the work that we do here at the Schomburg Center. So this was released uh, earlier this year, it's a press release. Uh, so the Schomburg Center has received a $2 million grant from the Mellon Foundation, which will be used to further the research of global black studies. The grants project, titled The Next Century of Black Studies, is designed to increase accessibility to the center's collection materials, engage new audiences in black studies, and fortify the future of research at the center. The work of this three-year grant will take place primarily in my division, Manuscripts, Archives, and Rare Books, as well as our Moving Image and Recorded Sound division, and will contribute immensely to the Schomburg Center's centennial celebration in 2025-2026. We have hired three amazing archivists who will be processing collections that we hope will form the foundation for the next century of black studies. My colleague, Shala Lynch, will share more details about this grant a little later in her presentation. Another big grant that I would like to highlight um, is our partnership between Schomburg and Fisk University. So, Fisk University and the Schomburg Center have received a two-year NHPRC planning grant for collaborative digital editions in African American, Asian American, Hispanic American, and Native American history and ethnic studies. The goal of this grant project, titled Remaking the World of Arturo Schomburg, is to launch a digital edition of the papers of Arturo Schomburg, the African diaspora's most famous bibliophile. Schomburg, an Afro-Puerto Rican who spent most of his life in New York City, founded the Negro Society for Historical Research, modeled a diasporic approach to studying black culture, and seeded two iconic archives in the 1920s and 30s, one here at the New York Public Library and the other at Fisk University. Our two institutions are partnering together for the first time to unite our records on Schomburg 
and collaborate with scholars to build an edition that will illuminate the global network of early 20th century bibliophiles, intellectuals, librarians, and street scholars who founded the field of black history. Um, I, I can't tell you how excited I am about the work that we're doing on this grant, so please stay tuned as we continue our planning efforts towards a digital edition of Schomburg's papers. So last but not least, um, as I mentioned at the start of my talk, I wanted to highlight a collection that I think um, greatly complements our current exhibition on display, Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration. Marking Time highlights artists who are or have been incarcerated alongside artists who have not been incarcerated, but whose practices expose aspects of the carceral state. Seen together, their work reveals how punitive governance, predatory policing, surveillance, and mass imprisonment impact millions of people. This is Anthony Horton. He was born in New York City in 1968 and grew up in several foster homes. For the majority of his adult life, he was homeless and lived underground in the subway tunnels. Together with author, artist, Yumi Landown, Horton wrote and illustrated um, a graphic novel called Pitch Black, Don't Be Scared, uh, published in 2008, um, which tells the story of how the two met, a little bit about his background and his life underground. Mr. Horton and Miss Landown met when he approached her on a downtown train and asked her whether she was an artist. They began talking about art and soon he showed her his work, sketches he had done from charcoal and fax machine ink that he rescued from the trash. In a beautiful New York Times write-up on his life, Miss Landown stated that, quote, he drew himself and the subways and things from his imagination, kind of a better world, end quote. Landown also shared that he taught gymnastics and art classes to other homeless people at Jan Hus Presbyterian Church on the Upper East Side. Horton also worked with the Theater of the Oppressed here in New York, uh, frequently playing the role of a police officer, very ironic, um, in the troupe's performances. Tragically, he died in a fire that ripped through his underground home in 2012. He was 43 years old. The Anthony Horton papers consist of a mock-up for the book he and Yumi Landown wrote and illustrated together, as well as letters he wrote to his co-author and friend from 2009 to 2010. The letters discuss their friendship and his thoughts. Most were written while he was an inmate in the Downstate Correctional Facility in Fishkill, New York. According to Landown, Horton was incarcerated because he was in possession of an antique knife that he wanted to sell. In one letter that Horton wrote to Landown, he vividly describes what he experienced while incarcerated at this facility. Quote, the first thing they do is strip you down and cut your hair. They don't let us keep anything, just law papers. I would not let them cut my hair again, so they put me in the hole. 14 days. Now that I'm finished with all the BS, I can have things now like books, paper, and photos. You know, the little things that help us pass the time. When we got here, they told us to send everything home or throw everything away. I could not keep the drawings and throw the other stuff away, so I sent you everything. I wanted you to have the drawings and the writings. Please feel free to throw away the boots, pants, and shirt. I won't need them." End quote. His letter gives us insight into the dehumanizing practices of the carceral state. It also lets us know that he recognized the importance and the value of his writings and artwork, so he sent them to a trusted friend for safekeeping. These writings, along with other original artwork and illustrations, are also included in his papers here at the Schomburg. This incredible collection is the evidence of a life lived, giving us a brief glimpse into Mr. Horden's hopes, dreams, creativity, and resilience. And though he may not have had a stable address to call home while he was alive, I'm happy that the Schomburg Center can be a home to his legacy and memory. If you'd like to learn more about this collection and see it firsthand, I'll be holding an open archive here in the Langston Hughes Auditorium immediately following the curator's presentations. 
Thank you for your time and your attention, and I'd now like to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Delila Scruggs. Good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. Um, as Barry said, my name is Delila Scruggs, and I am a curator of photographs and prints here at the Schomburg. In the very brief time I have with you today, I'm going to give a short overview of our collection, our holdings, and then I want to put on my art historian hat and spend the rest of the time examining one collection in particular. Our, our holdings are vast. Well over a million photographs are in our collection, and we can tell the entire arc of the history of photography with our collection, ranging from mid-19th century ambrotypes and daguerreotypes to iconic Harlem Renaissance photography to the Civil Rights Movement, and we have contemporary photography. Even uh, last year, I acquired things that were made in the year 2023. So, um, we have a lot. <laughs> uh, all of these, out of all these collections, I would like to focus on just one phenomenal collection by the photographer Jamel Shabazz. Jamel Shabazz is an acclaimed street fashion and documentary photographer, and he has published several photographic books and has been the subject of numerous exhibitions. In 2005, Jamel generously donated 23 photographs from his iconic A Time Before Crack series to the Schomburg. In his A Time Before Crack series, Jamel um, connected with everyday people in the streets of New York. These photographs document black and brown communities, primarily in Harlem and Brooklyn in the 80s and 90s. His work provides a window into the burgeoning impact of hip hop culture and gives a sense of the vitality of these communities, just as Reagan era policies, such as the war on drugs, decimated these communities through deliberate under-resourcing and over-policing. His work is shown on the walls of museums all over the world, but here at the Schomburg, we have the honor of having a set of small-scale photographs, eight by 10 inches. And these are special because these are the very prints that Shabazz would carry around with him as he engaged with people on the streets. He would show them his photographs as a way of showing what he, was, what he did and encouraging them to allow him to take their portraits. So this is before digital cam, you know, your phone where you could swipe through and say, hey, this is what I do. He carried these works as a portfolio in the streets. And so these are not just images. These are objects that hold the history of, a, of his methodology of street casting. As I began to study Jamal Shabazz's work, I was particularly drawn to this photograph in our collection. And I began to examine a compelling theme of twin portraiture in his work. Here, Jamel captures two girls in mirrored poses and they, as they turn towards the camera. A vertical staccato line of layered bricks creates a near symmetry that all but forces us to compare and contrast across the vertical axis of the photograph. We're seeing double. This work is part of an ongoing series called Deuce Portraits, and I have to thank Jamel for allowing me to show these others, um, which feature twins, friends, and lovers in matching outfits and poses. I've come to see a through line in Shabazz's practice that closely ties him to a larger black diasporic tradition of twin portraiture. There's a long history of twinning and doubling in Western culture, in Western photography. So this early photograph in our collection shows enslaved conjoined twins, Millie and Christine, and they were forced to perform at fairs and freak shows. This notion of the freakish spectacle of the twin continues into contemporary photography. This is a white contemporary photographer, Mary Ellen Marks, but also a person like Diane Arbus also delves into this idea of twins. Uh, but this idea of the twin as a spectacle or a freak comes from Western culture's privileging of the individual. And so twins in many contexts, particularly in pop culture, portray twins as kind of freakish or uncanny, a loss of selfhood and a unique identity. This is contrasted with African practices. There's a widespread practice of paired 
portrait photography across sub-Saharan Africa that emphasizes twinned identity to foreground social ties. Africa has the highest rate of twin births in the world, and distinctions between twins, uh, fraternal twins versus identical twins, are less important. Of course, it's a generalization that I'm making for the brevity of time, but in African practice very often, they're not making it, uh, a big deal about the identical appearance of people. The, the real significance has to do with the fact that they shared a womb together for nine months, that shared experience. In African photography, paired portraits not only depict actual twins, but also serve to, to highlight intimacy, linking, and belonging. In West Africa, if you're wearing identical clothes, it shows that metaphorically, you're cut from the same cloth. Um, and this is beautifully, this is not my idea, this is from this article, which you can find in our general reference and research division downstairs. Uh, it turns out when I talked to Jamel about my hypothesis, he, he mentioned that there was, that he was actually picking up on a phenomenon that's, that ties into community practices akin to West African pair portraits. He encountered many black and brown people who actively chose to dress alike. And he told me about the twinning practices that he observed in New York and the popular New York City DJ, DJ Vaughn Harper, who would announce a color of the day. And so kids, as they got dressed up to, you know, dressed for school, they would wear that color. And this is before colors became so associated with gangs. So here too, community ties are signified by the same color, cut from the same cloth. Twin imagery also abounds in the work of James Van Der Zee, a, um, a Harlem Renaissance photographer. James Van Der Zee had a penchant for using darkroom techniques to create repetition and posing his subjects to create a mirroring effect within his photographs. And Jamel has said that Van Der Zee was a significant so source of inspiration for him in his work. And what's really cool about uh, this work by Jamel is that he's making reference to the very darkroom techniques that Van Der Zee used. By giving the photograph the title Double Exposure, he's making reference to the darkroom technique of superimposing two or more photograph exposures on the, on the paper. And so his interest in twins also speaks to the nature of photography as a medium, the idea that photography replicates, replicates reality and replicates itself. And so as I went down the rabbit hole with this idea, I realized that Shabazz highlights the reproductive capacities of both photography and people. Much as photogra photographic negatives can produce several identical prints, Shabazz's deuce portraits of parents and children revel in the multiplication of the generations. And so to sum up, what I see in Shabazz is what he calls his deuce portraits is a drawing together of African cultural traditions, or at least the inheritance of that, and a black photographic tradition. His work speaks to community and kinship ties, but also to the camera's power to represent. I could go on and on, but I, but I have to wrap up. Jamel Shabazz's photographs are available uh, to anyone with a library card, and you can find his work as well as many other black photographers in our collection using our, our online catalog. If you, and I suggest if you're interested, you might want to take a picture of this screen because it has all the information you would need to know in order to gain access to our collection. Those are our hours, and if you want to know how to search the catalog, I highly recommend the lib guide that um, my, one of the librarians, Jack Patterson, created for us. Um, we are looking forward to serving you, and I look forward, and so I now pass it on to pass the mic to my colleague, Shala Lynch. Thank you very much. Hi, how's everybody doing? I, I'm a little nervous. Aren't my colleagues so impressive? Okay, <clears throat> to the script. <laughs> Welcome to the Schomburg Center and Research Library. I am Shala Lynch, the curator of the Moving Image and Recorded Sound Division, which is abbreviated as M-I-R-S. And so we are affectionately, affectionately known and called the mirrors division. Um, as the curator, I manage all of the sound, video, and film in the Schomburg's collections. Or as I like to say, we literally hold the voices, 
gestures, movements of black people from across the diaspora. I've been here for 10 years, and it still gives me chills to think about it and the collections. But let me tell you about, a little bit about the division's journey. Uh, we used to be in JBH, the Jean Blackwell Hudson uh, Research and Reference Division. If you look closely at this slide in the corner, you, we're in the back corner, and you may recognize that. The collections were boxed up in our division space. The sights and sounds were bound and muted. We needed a room of our own, which is what we have now. So the work began to have the space renovated, which is what you see in the photo. But what you don't see, and what I want to talk about today, is the behind-the-scenes work of the Mears team. And, and the work that we've been doing to make the collections accessible. With a generous grant from an anonymous donor, all the legacy special collections, all the backlogged boxes were identified and inventoried. This was the only route to participate in a library-wide initiative to digitize audio and moving image collections, again with a generous grant from the Mellon Foundation. Currently, Mirrors has nearly 10,000 digitized items. If we think about the two previous slides to go from that to where we are now, it is astonishing. 65% of them are available on site in the division. The remaining 35% are available on site by request. They're available to anyone with a? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They are organized by collection and discoverable through the research catalog. Um, this is an old slide, but you can see some of the research collection names. Mears currently has 307 collective catalog records representing that number of special collections. But we're not stopping there. With a generous grant from the Mellon Foundation, we're on a mission for all the collections to have finding aids, which means all the items in the collection will be described, and if digitized, then accessible. The larger grant is called The Next Century of Black Studies. I call the Mears contribution Operation Fully Described by 2025. And these, wonderful folks, are our not-so-secret agents who have taken up the mission. They are the archivists and librarians who have accepted this mission. The Mellon-funded archivists are on your top right, Ornella Baganzini, and on the top left, Lyric Evans Hunter. Um, their only job right now is to write finding aids towards our goal of being fully described in 2025. On the bottom is our division staff. From the left to the right, our archivist, Anika Paris, our cataloger, Jose Campana, and our reference librarian, Julian Gonzalez. If you're sticking around today, you'll actually get to meet Julian. He's introducing Beat Street in here at 4.30, I believe. On top of our regu their regular duties, they are also huge contributors to our goal, which is fully described in 2025. Now, Q. Schomburg, I always like to end any presentation with a clip of Arturo Schomburg, the founding collector and curator of the Schomburg Collection. He's with Catherine Latimer, the first black librarian hired, there she goes, by the New York Public Library. We have the privilege to build on the, their work and his collection. Schomburg wrote an essay about his collection that he called The Negro Digs Up His Past. So my charge, as I see it, in the relay race of history and culture is to digitize and describe our past. The, we are the Negroes who are doing that now. To ensure our voices, our historical legacy. Oh, it was supposed to run on a loop. The clip, that's okay. To ensure our voices, our historical legacy, our cultural riches are available to the next generation of students, scholars, activists, artists, and lifelong learners. And it does take a village. I hope you enjoyed meeting our little village. And what is the mission?
for the centennial. Join us in helping make that happen. I'm going to bring Brent to the stage now. Good afternoon. I will be uh, relatively brief, short and sweet. I am not a curator. I'm a professor at Columbia University. I teach in the Department of English and Comparative Literature and the Center for Jazz Studies. But I work here at the Schomburg as the director of the Scholars in Residence program. As you've already heard, uh, the collections of the Schomburg and the NYPL in general are open to anyone with a library card. But we do sponsor and support and give funding to support professional researchers, including academics like myself, independent scholars, creative writers, poets, novelists, and playwrights who are working on book projects that require long-term archival research. Um, you don't have to have a PhD to apply. You do have to be working on a book. But if there are any independent researchers or academics in the room who are interested, you can find information on our website our application, the next round of applications are due on December 1st. Um, the program was established informally in 1983 and has existed in its current form since 1986. So we are, as Joy mentioned, the oldest fellowship program in the New York Public Library system. And as far as I know, the oldest in terms of African diasporic culture and history, the oldest fellowship program in the world. Um, we're approaching our 40th anniversary, which will coincide with the centennial of the Schomburg in 2026. Um, and we will be celebrating, so come back for the party. We have sponsored almost 275 scholars and creative writers who have come here to do research using our resources and with our support. You may not realize that the work is going on. You may be sitting next to um, a professor or an independent researcher or a novelist um, if you're in the reading rooms. You will read or see some of their work when it comes out. So just to mention a couple of examples, Jeffrey Stewart's biography of Alain Locke, the, the Harlem Renaissance um, luminary called The New Negro, won the National Book Award a couple of years ago. He started that project as a scholar in residence. Nicole Fleetwood, who's a professor at NYU, was a scholar in residence when she started work on the exhibition, that is, the exhibition in the gallery spaces here now, Marking Time, that you've already heard a little bit about today. Uh, Nicole started that as a scholar in residence. So you, even if you don't realize it, see some of the most prominent work coming out has come through, been supported by this program. There are six to eight scholars in residence and, and writers in residence at any particular moment. they are short-term scholars. You can apply for a fellowship just to be here for one month. So short-term fellows are here from one to three months. Long-term fellows are here for six months to nine months. Uh, we also support the Lapidus Center for the Historical Analysis of Transatlantic Slavery, which is housed here at the Schomburg and their fellows. They have a separate fellowship program. Their fellows are part of the group as well. So you see one of the fellows a couple of years ago doing research in MARB and Manuscripts, Archives, and Rare Books. And that's our conference room downstairs uh, where we meet. We have, it's right under, this is not a public area. So unfortunately, I can't invite you down <laughs> because the scholars have their research materials and personal materials there but it's right underneath where we are. It's the hidden, sometimes I call it the bat cave. <laughs> it's the hidden uh, lair in the belly of the Schomburg, right underneath the theater here. We have a common area, a seminar room, and a suite of individual offices that you can see. That's the common area and the individual offices around the common area. Uh, just to give you an idea, the current cohort of scholars projects to look out for, are working on projects including the music and political activism of the legendary performer Harry Belafonte, whose archive was recently acquired by the Schomburg, the international relations of Ghana during the Cold War, the great black lesbian poet and scholar Cheryl Clark, whose personal papers are also held here, the rendition of fugitive slaves in the period before the Civil War, and a new biography of James Baldwin, 
just a smattering of some of the range of projects that people are working on. If you look on the website, the General Schomburg website, you'll see scholars and residents, and there's a list of the current fellows as well as past fellows if you're curious about what people work on. They have individual offices. Here's one of the individual offices, just to give you an idea. And here's, uh, this is the novelist A.J. Verdell, whose last book uh, was a, a memoir about her uh, relationship with the great Toni Morrison. Um, she's working on another novel about black cowboys in the Southwest in the 19th century. And she was a fellow last year, so this is her in her individual office. Um, I'll just show you a few shots of fellows from last year in their offices writing away and doing their research. The fellows also work in the divisions that you've just heard about. So here's Nina Mercer, one of the fellows from last year working in art and artifacts in the visual art, the painting and sculpture division of the Schomburg. Um, here's another fellow in mirrors in moving image and recorded sound, um, listening to a sound broadcast. Um, this on the right is a shot of our group meeting. And what we do is each fellow is working on their individual project, but once a week, usually on Tuesday or Wednesday, we meet to discuss some of the work that they're doing. So each individual fellow presents his or her a draft of the book that they're writing, and we discuss it and workshop it. It's, again, a closed private session, so it's not a big public presentation. It's really a workshop where we talk about craft, how to put together an argument, other sources that the scholar might want to consider. And we some have sometimes intense, very interesting discussions because people are coming from different directions. It's a lot of fun for me, uh, as someone who talks to a lot of literature professors and historians, to have not just the kind of scholars I talk to, but to have novelists in the room, or a poet in the room, um, or an anthropologist in the room, uh, or a performer in the room. And so we share ideas and tends to be extraordinarily helpful for the scholars as they're working on their projects. As I said, if you want to find out more, you can look on our website and get information both about the projects that people are doing and about the application process if you're interested, if anyone is working on a long-term project. I'm also happy to, to answer questions either here in person today or uh, by email. You can find the email, the, the Scholars in Residence Program email on the website. Uh, but just to give you a, a quick peek into the bat cave <laughs> and the professional researchers who are working here at the Schomburg. Thank you all for coming out. Um, I think this concludes the, uh, the presentations today, and we'll continue outside in, in the lobby. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much for being so attentive and being able to hear a little bit from our curators of just a few of our divisions. My name is Novella Ford, and I'm the Associate Director of Public Programs and Exhibitions. Now you will begin the rest of your day here at the Schomburg Center. Hopefully you have already picked up uh, your schedule. It's a little palm card, and it's on both sides, and it runs um, from the top of the day. So the next event will be right here inside this auditorium. You heard from Barry Brown about the Anthony Horton papers. And so she will have some of those items from the archive spread out on these tables down front, and she'll be able to take you through sort of a hands-on look at our archive. You know, we use the word archive, and that's not always um, evident to people exactly what is in an archive, what in your home looks like an archive. So we hope throughout the day you'll have an opportunity to explore and get a hands-on feel for what we have here at the Schomburg Center, but also get your wheels turning about what you might have at home. To that end, we also have a fantastic conversation coming up at 2.30 p.m. Um, that takes us through a conversation with Beverly Scobie and our, and our um, uh, our chief librarian of the Jean Blackwell Hudson and Research Division, Myra, uh, Myra Liriano, who they will be talking about her genealogy research into the book that she wrote about her family. And so following that particular program, which anybody who's watching online, you'll be able to watch that on live stream, there will be a genealogy workshop where you'll get to learn how to start uh, your own genealogy research, uh, as well as what kind of resources are available here at the Schomburg Center. Of course, this is 
our last sort of month before we close our current exhibition, Marking Time, which Barry also mentioned. So there will be a handful of workshops taking place throughout the day to help you get a more hands-on look and understanding of what is happening with people who are incarcerated, ways for us to bring out of the shadows and into the public sphere, conversations about incarceration, um, but from a tender place, right? Thinking about being in connection or being in community with family members or community members or somebody who you know or don't know who may be incarcerated, whether it's through a letter writing, which we are doing uh, with our Letters uh, to Keith uh, writing workshop, or about archiving art, you heard there would be conversations about how folks who have been incarcerated, who are artists, which is really the focus of the exhibition that we have here, sent artwork home to families, and that is how they were able to save so much of the artwork that they were creating and that we had the opportunity to show. And so a way to think about your own archive, your own artwork, and thinking about archiving both that work, but also ways in which you might support um, somebody else who might need that kind of help. I hope you will reach out to any of our volunteers that you see who have on cream t-shirts with the Schomburg logo on the front. Um, they can tell you a little bit more about the various um, highlights of the Schomburg Center. We have some really great uh, artwork that is embedded in the floors and also historical information uh, around black history, as we always like to say. Every month here is Black History Month at the Schomburg Center, so you do not have to wait till February. Also, if you just have a question, you're saying, I don't see it on the schedule, could you tell me about, hopefully somebody here will be able to help you. Last but not least, I will make mention that we do have a self-guided tour for the Marking Time exhibition, but we have three artist responses to the exhibition that will happen throughout the day. So again, take a real good look at your um, palm com card for the kind of activities we have taking place. There's a great workshop that will happen in the Photographs and Prints Division, which we heard from Dr. Scruggs um, and the Jamil Shabazz exhibition, um, Jamil Shabazz collection of photos that we have, and that starts at 3 p.m. Um, and then, and again, anybody who is watching online, if you want to text someone, we are screening the film, Beach Street, because we are still celebrating hip hop history, 50th anniversary of hip hop history, um, but also this month is considered hip hop history month, so it is our way of sort of putting the period on this particular celebration, but we celebrate all things black history as well as hip hop all year long. So thank you all for joining us, and uh, stay for the day and tell a friend. Have a good evening, good day. And again, so if you want to stay here for the open archive, anybody in this room, uh, at about 1 o'clock, 1.15, we'll have some items out for you to be able to have a hands-on engagement with. <laughs>